His talk for today is How to Make a Robot That Feels. So please welcome Kevin O'Regan. So thank you very much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. This is uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger in the film Terminator, playing the role of a very uh, evolved robot. <clears throat> when he falls into a bath of burning oil, the question is, does he feel the heat? Now, I think there are two components to the feel that we probably think uh, Terminator has in this. There's a cognitive component, and there's a phenomenal component. Um, the cognitive component, if you think about it, uh, what Terminator feels about this is that he knows that his organism is poised to make use of the sensory information coming in, and he's going to make use of this in order to grasp the chain and to jump out. But there's more because he, as a robot, is an evolved robot, and he knows that he, Terminator, has these faculties. And so not, on, not only is his organism poised to do this, but he is poised to cognitively access the fact that his organism is so poised. So there's a sort of higher order thing here. What's more implicit in this is the idea that he exists as a self. So you have to postulate that there's a self in there. Now notice that in the film Terminator, all this is sort of taken for granted. Uh, Terminator goes around uh, talking to people and having moral judgments. Not, this doesn't pose a problem at all. Uh, in the film, and I think there's a reason for this, and the reason is that people and scientists today think that all this is essentially amenable to science. It's really what Ned Block calls the easy uh, uh, conscious access. It's the easy problem of consciousness. Um, in fact, perhaps in a few years, we'll all have iPhone applications uh, that do this kind of thing. But then there's another component to this, and this is the feel. Does Terminator actually feel the heat? Now, this is a different question, and a lot of people think that the question uh, has no answer because there is an explanatory gap that prevents us from understanding the, the question. In particular, nobody has any idea of how it could be that the real feel of the heat, the pain, uh, could uh, be generated in the brain let alone in a robot. <clears throat> and uh, even if we had uh, a, a, an idea of what generated uh, the feel, we would then have to ask, well, what, it is it? what is it about the particular feel that gives it a, a feel of heat rather than a feel of, say, coldness? Uh, when Terminator looks at a red patch, what is it about the feel of red that makes it red rather than green? So the question is, why is there something it's like for a Terminator to have a feel, and why when he has a feel, are those feels different from other possible feels? Both of those questions seem to be mysterious, and uh, they seem to not have any kind of answer in a, a physical um, instantiation. So what is the problem here? The problem is this problem of the explanatory gap. My suspicion is, well, in fact, Ned Block yesterday was saying something almost jokingly, perhaps, that the explanatory gap is necessary uh, for a good theory of consciousness. He's not trying to get rid of it. He's trying to include it in the theory somehow. I'd like to suggest that the explanatory gap is actually a tactic that people use to uh, preserve the last bastion of humanity. It avoids admitting that we are mere robots. I think the explanatory gap is actually an error of reification. Let's take the analogy with the problem of life at the beginning of the 20th century. People were looking for a vital spirit that would explain uh, what, why certain systems were alive and others were not. Today, today we know that life is not the kind of thing that is generated by biological organisms. Life is just a word. It's a word that describes the way certain organisms interact with their environment. It's an abstraction. It, doesn't, it isn't to be found inside the organisms. It's a way of talking about the way organisms behave, uh, potentially. So it's a category error, as Ryle said, to think that life is somehow generated in um, biological organisms. 
it's an error of reification to think that life oozes out of uh, uh, nerve cells and biological cells. And I think that the explanatory gap derives from making that same error with regard to consciousness. I think it's a mistake to think that consciousness, and in particular feel, the feel of redness, for example, is something that's generated in the brain. It's a category error to think that. Feel is just not the kind of thing that's generated at all. And this is the idea that I put forward in my book, Why Red Doesn't Sound Like a Bell, that just came out with Oxford University Press, where I propose a thing that I call the sensory motor approach to phenomenal consciousness. So whereas the classical approach takes the idea that feel is generated by the brain, um, the sensory motor approach takes a view which is analogous to the view of life and says that feel is a way of interacting with the environment. Now, at first, this doesn't seem to make much sense. So let me give you an example which does make more sense. And it's the feel of softness. When you squish a sponge, it feels soft. Where is that softness generated? Isn't that a stupid question? We all know that softness isn't generated anywhere. It would be a mistake to look for a softness generating feel in the brain somewhere because softness is a fact about what happens when you squish sponges. It's a law that links your actions to the incoming sensations that happen because of those actions. The quality of the feel of softness lies in the sensory motor law that governs your interactions with soft things. The feel of softness is generated nowhere. It is an abstract quality. It is the sensory motor law that describes that interaction. And the sensory motor approach takes this idea and applies it to all fields. Of course, there's more. To actually consciously experience a feel, you have to attend to the fact that you are engaged with the environment in a way that obeys certain sensory motor laws. So you need the attending and the cognitively accessing, and you need a self. But these, as I said at the beginning, are the easy problems of consciousness, and they're amenable to science. The hard part was explaining where the feel comes from. So if we can admit that in a few years on our iPhones we'll have all the other stuff, well then, if we can get the answer to the quality question, well then we'll be far and away. So let's see whether the sensory motor approach helps us in any way to answer the critical questions about, the, about feel, namely, uh, why is there something it's like, and why do feels differ among themselves? So let me take the, first, the second question first. Why do feels differ the way they do? Why, for example, do feels in different sensory modalities differ the way they do? Why is hearing different from seeing? Um, well, why is hearing different from seeing? According to the sensory motor approach, hearing must be different from seeing only and precisely because of the sensory motor laws that govern hearing and seeing. And here are just some examples of such sensory laws. And we can see that instead of appealing to neural networks which have special substances oozing out of them that explain why they make you hear rather than make you, feel, make you see, I simply apply to the, the obvious fact that seeing involves certain types of changes when you blink your eyes, when you move forward, that are quite different from those that, you, that, you, uh, that, that are uh, uh, obeyed when you're hearing. Now what's interesting is this simple philosophical idea makes scientifically verifiable predictions. If it's true that what determines the, the what it's like of seeing and hearing is simply the laws of input-output relationship that govern interactions, well then you should be able to get the feel of hearing through vision or the feel of vision through hearing provided you arrange things properly so that the sensory motor laws are those of the appropriate modality. And of course we all know that that's exactly what's done in sensory substitution devices. Now I don't have time to go through these, but there are a number of devices that have been developed over the last years, including even ones that give you new sensory modalities like a magnetic sense. Now let me ask another question about the explanatory gap, na namely why is it that feels feel like something rather than feeling like nothing? Now, 
Oh, I'll leave out color. I also have some stuff about color. I can explain why red looks red rather than green, but I'm not going to have time to go into it. So why do fields feel like something? This is a philosopher's jargon to say that fields feel like something. I think as a scientist, we want to try and find an operational definition of what we mean by feeling like something. So perhaps what we could do is compare fields that feel like something to fields which don't feel like anything. So for example, autonomic functions in the nervous system, or thoughts. In a way, thoughts don't have a sensory feel either. Autonomic functions, after all, are controlled by sensory systems that are perhaps almost as complicated as our normal sense modalities, and yet we don't feel them. I don't feel the CO2 level in my blood. Why not? Similarly, thoughts. Thoughts don't have that sensory presence that feeling the real redness of red possesses. Why not? Obviously, if we were to look in the brain for an answer, we would be faced by an explanatory gap. But the sensory motor approach looks for an answer to those questions in terms of the laws that describe my interaction with the world when I am having a sensory feel as opposed to indulging in a thought or having autonomic uh, interactions. I have to examine the differences in the sensory motor laws uh, in order to explain the difference between the what it's likeness of real sensory fields and the what it's likeness of autonom autonomic functions in the nervous system or thoughts. So what is it then about a real interaction with a sensory world that gives me the impression that uh, it's real and that it has this sensory presence? I think the answer is pretty obvious. The fact is that when you're really interacting with the world, you really are doing something. So it's real, and so it must have a, a sensory, some kind of sensory presence. But how do you know that you're really doing something? I think the answer it lies in three aspects of sensory motor interactions that you have with the real world when you're using your normal sense modalities. And these are what I call bodiliness, insubordinateness, and grabbiness. Bodiliness is the fact that when you move your body, the sensory input from real sensory systems changes dramatically. If I'm looking at a red patch of color and I move my eyes or my body, the sensory input on my retina changes dramatically. But I, if I'm thinking about a red patch and I move my eyes, nothing happens. And it's true of all sensory modalities connected with the outside world that bodily motions change dramatically the incoming information, whereas this is obviously not true of autonomic systems. My digestion, my CO2 level are only influenced in a minor way by my voluntary actions. So bodiliness is something that allows me to distinguish, allows my brain to distinguish between information coming from the outside world through the normal sensory channels and stuff coming from the inside or from thoughts. Another fact that allows me to verify the reality of my interaction with the world is insubordinateness. That's what, I, what I mean by that is the fact that even though bodiliness is an important factor, it's not the only factor that causes sensory input to change because the outside world, after all, has a life of its, uh, of its own. Mice flit across the floor without me doing anything about it. Things change in the world. Uh, sounds occur without me change, voluntarily doing anything. So the world and my interaction with the world possesses what I call insubordinateness because of this. And then there's grabbiness. This is a particularly interesting and important one. Grabbiness is the fact that sensory systems are hardwired in such a way as to peremptorily interfere with cognitive processing. I think that our low-level sensory systems must have connections to the areas of the brain that are involved in cognitive processing, and they create something like an interrupt that prevents cognitive processing from going on in a normal way under certain circumstances. And those are circumstances when there's a loud noise, a bright flash of light, a sudden tactile stimulation. These are cases where automatically and without us being able to control it, our attention is directed towards the source of change. And this is not true of other sensory systems in the body. My CO2 level, if it changes, if, if my, my, my vestibular system, if it has a sudden change in stimulation, this may make, cause me to fall down, to cause me to feel weak, but it doesn't peremptorily interact with my cognitive processing. So here we have another 
fact about sensory systems. It's an objective, sci scientifically verifiable fact, uh, which, which uh, characterizes something about the sensory presence that is involved in sensory experiences. So as an example of the application of these three concepts, bodiliness, insubordinateness, and grabbiness, I want to take the example of vision. Why does vision seem to us like it's happening to us, like it's present? Why is there something it's like to see? Why do we see the outside world as being spread before us in such a rich and detailed way as being continually present and continually visible and colorful? Obviously, bodyliness contributes to this, because if I were to just slightly move my eyes or body, uh, uh, there will be a very large change on my retina. And so vision has bodyliness. It has insubordinateness, because if things move around outside, it changes without me doing anything, the information. And then there's grabbiness. This is particularly interesting. Under normal circumstances, if something changes in the visual field, your attention is immediately attracted to it. And so you you have the impression of seeing it. But my prediction is that if I were to in invalidate the grabbiness of the visual system, is if I were to make it non-grabby, which is what I've done here, I've made, I'm making changes in this picture in, so slowly that it doesn't activate the grabbiness of your visual system. And so your attention does not go to the location in the image that's changing. Under these circumstances, large parts of the visual field uh, can change without you noticing it at all. So I don't know if you've seen here, but there's a very, very big change occurring very gradually, and many of you will probably not have seen it. And in fact, the change is so big, it occupies about a quarter, maybe even a third of the picture. So I'll show you what the change is. I'll go back to what the picture was initially. It was the ground plane which was red and not blue. So this is what I think is, a, is, a, is, is a, a nice scientific validation of the idea that what part, part of what we mean by the visual presence of the visual world derives from this notion of grabbiness. You've probably, so this is the, the notion of change. This is an instance of change blindness. This is a well-known um, uh, phenomenon that I discovered with Ron Rensink and Jim Clark. And it, the change blindness was predicted from this idea uh, that vision is, in some sense, uh, determined. The quality of the, what its likeness, the presence, the perceptual presence of vision is determined partly by the grabbiness of the visual, uh, 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 the low-level visual system, its capacity to interrupt cognitive processing. So I think that these examples have shown that by taking this new view of what feel is, this philosophical idea that, that feel is not something that happens to us, but feel is the quality of an interaction that we have with the, with the world. This allows us to uh, solve both the problem of the, what its likeness of the visual, of, of, of perceptions of sensory experience in general, um, and, and, and the question of why uh, fields differ um, among themselves. So I think this approach solves the hard problem. It, it bridges the explanatory gap. It generates scientific research paradigms sensory substitution. I haven't talked about the phenomenology of touch. The rubber hand illusion is something that's predicted by it. Color, I haven't had time to tell you about color, but I've had some extremely exciting results by simply taking this simple philosophical idea that color is not something that happens to us, but it's something that we do. Color is the way colored surfaces change the incoming light. And from that, I was able to make surprising predictions that, that have not so, so far been, uh, uh, had, had, that had not been uh, confirmed by, um, that had not been able to be predicted by uh, other approaches. Now, in all this, of course, the, what I've been talking about has really just been uh, c concerned uh, with the quality of fields, the actual a consciousness of feels, I claim, is simply determined by a form of cognitive access that you have to the fact that you are currently involved in some interaction with the world. So to kind of uh, unfold the whole idea, uh, having a sensory experience, being conscious of a feel, 
un under this theory consists in I, myself, which I think is something that uh, is perhaps difficult to explain from scientific point of view, but is not uh, uh, completely impossible. It may, it's, uh, the I, the self, is a social construct. It might be what then it calls uh, uh, an, uh, a center of narrative gravity or uh, some social construction. So I have a higher order cognitive access to the exercise of a skill. And that skill uh, uh, determines the quality of the feel that I'm having. If um, the skill I'm involved in has bodiliness, insubordinateness, and grabbiness, then it will have se sensory presence, and I will have, and it will be perceived by me as corresponding to um, uh, something that has a what it's like. The, the skill itself determines the different qualities, and the what it's like is determined by objective characteristics uh, of the interaction, namely the bodiliness, insubordinateness, and grabbiness. So to, to summarize, uh, how can we make a robot that feel? The first part I said was not a problem in the future probably. And the second part, the phenomenal component, in this view then, does not pose a problem either. There is no explanatory gap. We can get rid of it because what we really mean when we feel is to interact with the world. And the reason there's something it's like to us is because certain types of interaction, namely sensory interactions with the real world, possess bodiliness, insubordinateness, and grabbiness. And that's what we really mean when we say that, that, that things have sensory presence, or a, what it, a sensory what it's like. And why do fields differ among themselves? Well, they differ in the ways that are determined by the sensory motor laws that determine them. So if you want more information, it's all in my book. Thank you. Okay, we got time for some questions. Pavel? What's up, Pavel? Right, so I, I just wonder how you would do all this with dreams, and, and can we have a robot that has similar kind of dream feelings and dream experiences? Dreams? And dreams, and for example, in the case of vision, so how, how would you go? We have no incoming light, so are you appealing to memory, or don't we need some internal representations here? Well, as I say, there's two components to this theory. There's a kind of cognitive component, and there's an actual component where you're interacting with the world. And if your cognitive component is dreaming, then it thinks that it is currently involved in this interaction, but it's mistaken. But nevertheless, you have the experience, because having the experience involved is, uh, involves, uh, uh, re requires you to be cognitively engaged in this way. Um, I think one way in which your, the fact that your analysis of sensory quality is inadequate shows up in the distinction you try and draw between uh, so-called phenomenology-free thought and sensory experience. So, I mean, just to take one of your three criteria, it's quite clear that uh, thought can kind of essentially Certain episodes of thought can more or less essentially involve bodiliness, as when I, for example, do mathematics on my fingers. Um, and it seems that it could probably involve the other two criteria as well. So either you want to say thought it does involve phenomenology, or at least can do, which is, I suppose, I would want to say, or uh, you need something further in your analysis of sensory quality, it seems to me. Right. So this is very interesting. And in fact, this is uh, what I suggest in what I call the phenomenality plot. The idea would be that the degree to which people would be willing to say, yes, there's something it's like for this experience, will be determined by these objective aspects of the interactions that they are uh, currently uh, undergoing. Now, thoughts, um, uh, if you look on this graph here, which shows the degree to which a particular experience involves bodiliness and grabbiness, you see that thoughts are down on the lower left-hand corner. Because when you think and you move, it doesn't have much, it doesn't change your thoughts very much. And thoughts usually do not wake you up and cause your cognitive processes to change because it's you who's usually in control of your thoughts, except in exceptional cases. And in those exceptional cases, for example, where you have obsessive thoughts, in those cases, people may actually come to believe that those, or may actually say that those thoughts have more of 
more phenomenality and more something it's like. Yeah. So the whole idea is that, that it's not an all or nothing thing. It's that you should be able to plot on a plot like this all experiences we have and predict the degree to which people would agree that uh, they possess this, asp this, this quality of phenomenality. That's, that's better. I mean, you don't want to be committed to saying that thoughts don't wake you up. I mean, thoughts wake me up practically every night. Um, and it's, yeah, I think you're better off saying yeah. that there's a kind of a spectrum and perhaps some thoughts can occur to the far top right corner. Yeah. Well, that I seems think to me more plausible. I think it's very interesting because this here would be my project, scientific project for the next decade, which would be to look in detail to see if we can predict uh, by analyzing these objective facts about sensory motor interactions with the world, the degree to which people agree that there's something it's like to have, it's a way of decomposing the notion of something it's like. Three. Thanks for the great talk. It was, it was really good. Uh, so. Uh, one way to think about what you have given here is uh, to convince us that the sensory motor approach has the right grain of a structure to explain, for example, differences in phenomenology. Uh, and But you seem to think that the sensory motor approach does more than that. It also explains what there is phenomena, ph phenomenology in the first what, place. What there is what? That there is, there is phenomenal consciousness in the first place, in addition to explaining the differences. And there, your argument uh, sounded like you think that because uh, uh, sensory motor approach, the sensory motor approach emphasizes interaction with the real world, uh, that explains why that this kind of uh, view uh, get, it makes it clear why this kind of view has an explanation of uh, the presence of phenomenal consciousness. But why why isn't the derival view? Uh, the same in this in this respect like the, if 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 consciousness is grounded let's say in the in the brain it's it's real interaction with with something that is real the brain is real yeah. so no, why, right. why does externalization add more explanatory power that's so I, I think you're right in a way i have no objection to that in fact the role of action in this so-called sensory motor theory has been exaggerated by my own colleagues uh, for example alva noe uh, I think is wrong about the role of action. I think that, in fact, uh, if you really think about what you mean by an experience, depending on what kind of experience it is, it can involve action to a greater or lesser degree. I, here in this talk, I've been talking about sensory fields. So what I mean by sensory fields are those associated with the classic five sensory modalities, you know, hearing, vision, touch, etc. And those fields involve interacting with the body in the world. But if you had an agent, an artificial agent that lived on the internet and had no body, for example, I think you could also talk about sensory motor interactions that this agent had, except it would be a virtual kind of interaction. And I have no objection to saying that the quality of those interactions would, have, would, would constitute a kind of feel. And, and thought, as I was saying a minute ago, you could say thought has a kind of feel because it involves an interaction with perhaps yourself in some sense. So I have no objection to that. But what I, my main point is that if you think about feel as being generated by the brain, you're up to an explanatory gap. If you think of feel as an abstract concept that describes your ways of interacting, then you're out of the explanatory gap. And you can furthermore do science and make predictions. Hello. Thank you very much for your talk. I would like to ask you uh, to say a little bit more about this notion of interaction and um, what would you be willing to say about cases in which uh, the way of interacting changed radically, like cases of lock-in syndrome, uh, given so their auditory experiences are radically different from us and whether that leads us to a new explanatory gap. I mean to what extent they differ and if they at all. Thank you. Yes, I think, again, this is a question of the, of the role of action. So clearly, somebody with locked-in syndrome has in the past acted, and he has established his sensory categories through action. My idea is a bit like the notion that Poincaré suggested about physics. What physicists do is they make measurements. 
and they note how, those, how their actions upon the world change the world. And what physics is, is a theory about how uh, physicists' actions change the world. And from that, from those, from that set of uh, sensory motor contingencies, essentially, physicists build up concepts, like the concept of mass or the concept of length. And even though today you don't have to make any actions to understand the concept of mass and length, they are inherently they inherently require the notion of action. Physics is based on action. It's a theory about how we can interact with the world. And in the same way, our sensations can only come from noting the changes that we effect upon our environment through our actions. If we later end up in a locked-in syndrome case, then we can refer back in time to what we previously experienced, and we can nevertheless have the same experiences we had at the time. But if we have never lived in a world where we can act, then we can never establish the sensory categories that, we have that, we, that, that normal people establish. So my claim would be that somebody who is paralyzed from birth uh, and who's limited in his interactions with the world would have different kinds of sensory uh, fields as, than, than normal people. Uh, uh, I'm over here. Uh, uh, it's a very interesting talk, and uh, I think a lot of the things you say are true, but uh, I need help because uh, it seems to me that uh, when I, I make sure I'm thinking of uh, Terminator and not Arnold, that uh, I, can, uh, I can imagine in a rough, very rough way, uh, how uh, the Terminator can have bodliness Right. That is. That is. Sorry, can have what? Bodiliness. Yeah. Right. In, inputs to its uh, sensors do depend on its motions. Uh, uh, insubordinateness. Right. Uh, the, what happens in the world is not entirely dependent on his motions and uh, grabbiness. Uh, its uh, designers would have just had to build in a, 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 a automatic uh, capture of attention system. So I, so I can imagine a robot that has all those qualities. And uh, this is kind of a funny way to ask a question, I guess. But I, I just have to report that, that uh, it doesn't seem to me when I you know, try to richly endow the Terminator with all of that, that I've come anywhere close to endowing it with feelings. So uh, I, I, I just I want to ask you for, you know, Say, say more to uh, help me out there. Yes, well, all I can do is say that if you really think about what you mean when you say, yes, I feel this feel, if you think about it hard, you'll realize that these notions of grabbiness, bodiliness, etc., really participate in, in, in that feel. And if you try and go all the way to the end, uh, as deeply as possible, uh, trying to decompose what you mean by, by saying, I feel it, then I think there will be nothing left but these objective laws that uh, govern the sensory motor interaction that you're involved with. And I think this phenomenali phenomenality plot thing, if, if I could do more research on this and look in greater detail how each of different emotions, for example, each different experiences uh, actually uh, are, are judged by people and, and show how, how, these, uh, how, how, how these objective uh, characteristics of bodiliness, insubordinateness, etc., actually predict the degree to which people claim they feel, then, the w then we will be making the theory more and more plausible. One interesting component, one interesting uh, question uh, uh, involves pain. Why does pain hurt? You know, uh, in fact, this, I've been thinking about, about how bodiliness, grabbiness, etc., could account for the hurt of pain. And I must say that here, I don't think that I can completely account for the hurt of pain. I can account for the fact that pain causes your attention to uh, be focalized uh, completely on something. But then there are all sorts of other things like orgasms, or hiccups, or tickling, or itches, which also cause your attention to be completely focalized on something. And yet they don't hurt. Why not? 
And my only, um, and, and this is a, another interesting uh, a, a possible scientific uh, uh, direction for study, would be to claim that the hurt of pain is a purely social uh, construct. And, and, and I think that's a really interesting idea because it suggests things like, well, hypnotism uh, and maybe trance phenomena uh, could, could, uh, could easily uh, uh, be accommodated by such a view. My question is irrelevant because I was going to ask about migraines in, in, in the sense that nothing you do when you're in, in that kind of pain makes any difference to it. So it's high on grabbiness and bodiliness, but it, in terms of sensory motor contingencies, it's nothing. But in a way, you've given the best answer I think you can, which doesn't entirely resolve it, but it yeah, gets yeah. us some way. Obviously, Thank there's you. work to be done, but I think this is, I mean, the, the scientific predictions I've made on color and, and change of blindness and things suggest to me that I'm on the right path with this view, and we can develop it further and uh, answer questions like the one. But ones. I would go more in the direction of when it grabs the attention, what is it doing, and why is it horrible, because that's that's really the essence of it. It's horrible because it's all the thing, other things we might be trying to do are blocked. So the whole system might be trying to look at something or you know, get on with some job or something else, and the pain is taking massive amounts of attention away from them. So that's kind of that's a horrible thing to happen to an organism that can't get on with it. Yes, in fact, in with. pain research, loss of control is something that has really contributes strongly to one's feeling of being in pain. The last one, here. We'll have, we'll have some more time for questions at the end. Well, first, I'm not convinced that the problem of life has been solved. Um, uh, doesn't this idea go back to Aristotle, who projected qualia out onto the world from the heart? Okay, let's say the brain. And in any case, who or what in the brain is doing this? And uh, how does it, in the sensory motor, distinguish conscious from non-conscious uh, perceptions? Because we perceive, it's the opposite of change blindness. We perceive a lot more than we are actually conscious of. Well, so. I'm not sure I really understand your question, because what I've essentially done in this theory is to redefine what I mean when I say uh, I'm having a conscious feel. I'm using the words in a very precise way. And when you say a thing like, um, is this a conscious brain state? That, to me, is a, is, a, is a statement that makes no sense in my vocabulary. You know, It's like the statement uh, asking, is a virus alive? Or is a bacterium alive? These are not. These are questions. They're not questions of matters of fact. They're questions of matters of definition. And so, what I've done in in this theory is to set up a scientific way of talking about certain aspects of our uh, experiences, a way of talking about them which gives rise to scientific uh, paradigms. Uh, it may not answer all the questions. Like it doesn't tell you about the the poetry of of feel. But, but aren't you just sweeping it under the carpet? I mean, aren't you just getting rid of the problem? Well, I'm, like maybe I'm it? getting rid of some of the poetry the, uh, uh, of feel, but I'm, I, in, in, in so doing, I'm gaining a scientific, uh, uh, I'm gaining in scientific uh, productivity, I'd say. But I think that's what happened when, when, uh, when DNA was discovered and we re realized that life uh, was not uh, uh, created by our... By well, the there's spirit. still a few mysteries in both areas. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you very much.